The book of Revelation stands as a compelling testament to the promise of Jesus' triumphant return as the sovereign king, destined to restore his people and herald the dawn of a new creation. This enduring promise serves as a beacon of hope, inspiring generations of God's faithful to persevere through trials and tribulations, steadfast in the face of persecution and hardship. Today, we invite you to join us on an enthralling expedition into the heart of one of the Bible's most enigmatic and captivating books. As we embark on this journey together, we encourage you to relax, open your minds and hearts, and immerse yourselves in the profound mysteries that the book of Revelation holds. Let's explore these ancient texts together, uncovering the layers of meaning and the powerful messages they convey to us, even today. The book of the Revelation was written by John, the beloved disciple of Jesus, who wrote the Gospel and the letters of John. This book presents a series of prophetic dreams and visions, offering a glimpse into God's celestial perspective on both history and unfolding events. John characterizes this revelation as a prophecy, signifying it as a divine communication delivered through a prophet to God's people. Typically, such messages serve to either warn or provide comfort during times of upheaval. This apocalyptic prophecy was not an abstract concept. It was directed to real individuals whom John knew personally. Through this, John emphasizes the immediacy and relevance of the message, bridging the celestial with the terrestrial and weaving the past, present, and future into a cohesive narrative designed to guide warn, and comfort the faithful in their spiritual journey. The book of Revelation is crafted as a circular letter to seven churches in ancient Asia, embodying the number seven symbolic significance of completeness rooted in the Old Testament's Sabbath cycle. John's deliberate incorporation of this symbolism throughout the book offers explicit guidance on its interpretation, emphasizing the thorough and symbolic nature of his message. Exiled on the island of Patmos, John beheld a vision of the risen Jesus, magnificently enthroned as the world's king, standing amidst seven blazing lights, symbols of the seven churches in Asia Minor. Jesus directly addressed the unique challenges each church faced. Some grappled with apathy due to wealth and affluence, while others were ensnared in moral compromise, engaging in ritual meals and immorality within pagan temples. Amidst these, a faithful remnant endured harassment and violent persecution, with Jesus' forewarning of an intensifying tribulation that would test their allegiance, compromise, or steadfast faithfulness. By John's time, the era of Nero's brutal executions had ended, and Domitian's persecution was likely in full swing, so the temptation was to deny Jesus, either to avoid persecution or simply to join the spirit of the Roman age. Jesus implored them towards unwavering faithfulness, promising victory, literal conquest. For those who conquer, he promised rewards drawn from the book's climactic vision of heaven and earth's union. And so, this opening section, it sets up the main plot tension that will drive the storyline in this book. Will Jesus' people endure? Will they inherit the new world that God has in store? Why is faithfulness to Jesus described as conquering? The rest of the book is John's answer. John experiences a vision of God's celestial throne room, vividly depicted through imagery reminiscent of Old Testament prophets. Encircling God are beings and elders embodying all of creation and the nations of humanity, all paying homage and pledging their loyalty to the singular Holy Creator. In God's grasp lies a scroll sealed with seven wax seals. This scroll represents the culmination of the Old Testament prophet's messages and the sealed visions of Daniel, prophesying the complete realization of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. However, it initially appears that no one is capable of opening the scroll until John hears of someone who can, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David. 
These titles, steeped in Old Testament tradition, refer to the prophesied messianic king expected to establish God's kingdom through martial victory. This is what John anticipates, yet when he turns to see, he doesn't behold a fierce lion king. Instead, he sees a lamb that appears to have been slain, yet stands alive and ready to unveil the scroll. This juxtaposition starkly contrasts the anticipated image of power with a profound symbol of sacrifice and resurrection. This portrayal of Jesus as the slain lamb is pivotal for grasping the essence of the book. John communicates that the Old Testament's promise of a triumphant kingdom of God was initiated by the Messiah's crucifixion. Jesus triumphed over his adversaries by sacrificing himself for them, embodying the true Passover lamb to facilitate their redemption. His resurrection ensures that his crucifixion was not a defeat, but a coronation, marking his victory over evil. Thus, the vision culminates with the Lamb and the one on the throne being venerated together as the singular, true Creator and Redeemer. And the slain Lamb begins to open the scroll. It's a symbol of His divine authority to guide history to its conclusion, which brings us to the next section of the book. The three cycles of seven, seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. Each cycle depicts God's kingdom and justice coming here on earth as in heaven. Some interpret the three series of seven divine judgments as depicting a chronological sequence of events, past, present, or future, culminating in Jesus' return. However, John intricately intertwines these sevens, with the final set of bowls emerging from the seventh trumpet and seal, and the seven trumpets unfolding from the seventh seal, reminiscent of nesting dolls. Each series crescendos into the final judgment, sharing similar conclusions. So, it's more likely that John is using each set of seven to depict the same period of time between Jesus' resurrection and future return, from three different perspectives. So, the slain lamb begins to open the scroll's first four seals, and John sees four horsemen that symbolize times of war, conquest, famine, and death. In other words, a tragically average day in human history. The fifth seal then reveals the souls of Christian martyrs before God's heavenly throne, with their innocent blood's plea ascending before God, akin to smoke from an altar of incense. These martyrs are comforted with a promise of rest, yet with a somber acknowledgement that more Christians will face martyrdom. However, it is assured that this period of suffering will not endure indefinitely. A great earthquake shook the earth when the sixth seal was opened. The sun turned black, the moon became red, stars fell from the sky, and mountains and islands were moved. Amidst this chaos, all the people on earth hid underground. They cried out for death because the devastation was terrible. At this moment, John observes an angel bearing a signet ring, arriving to bestow a mark of protection upon God's servants, those weathering the severe tribulations. John then hears the count of those sealed, 144,000. This figure represents a symbolic military census, reminiscent of the one detailed in Numbers chapter 1, comprising 12,000 individuals from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now pay attention. The number of this army is what John initially heard, much like the earlier mention of the conquering Lion of Judah. Yet in both instances, what he subsequently saw was a remarkable realization of those martial symbols through Jesus, the slain lamb. When he beholds this messianic force of God's kingdom, it comprises individuals from all nations, actualizing God's ancient covenant with Abraham. This diverse, multi-ethnic legion of the Lamb stands before God, purified by the Lamb's sacrifice. They earn the title of conquerors not through violence against their foes, but through endurance and testimony, mirroring the Lamb's own path. After this, the seventh and final seal is broken, 
But before the scroll is open, the seven warning trumpets emerge and fire is taken from the incense altar. It symbolizes the cry of the martyrs and it's cast onto the earth, bringing the day of the Lord to its completion. Now, with the seven trumpets, John backs up and he retells the story again, this time with images from the Exodus story. So, the first five trumpet blasts replay the plague sent upon Egypt, and then the sixth trumpet releases the four horsemen that came from the first four seals. However, John tells us that despite all these plagues, the nations did not repent, just like Pharaoh didn't in the Exodus story. So it seems that God's judgment alone will not bring people to humble repentance before him. Then, an angel brings the unsealed scroll that was opened by the Lamb. And just like Ezekiel, John is told to eat the scroll and then proclaim its message to the nations. Finally, the Lamb scroll is open, and now we will discover how God's kingdom will come here on earth. This revelation unfolds through two emblematic visions. Initially, John beholds the temple of God and the martyrs at the altar, receiving instructions to measure and consecrate them. However, the narrative shifts as the outer courts and the city itself are left unprotected and subsequently desecrated by the nations. Some interpret this imagery as a literal foretelling of Jerusalem's destruction. Does this scenario sound familiar from recent news broadcasts? In the scroll's second vision, God appoints two witnesses as prophetic representatives to the nations. While some interpret this as a literal reference to two prophets destined to emerge in the future, John identifies them as lampstands, a symbol he consistently uses for the churches. Thus, it's more plausible that this vision symbolizes the prophetic mission entrusted to the followers of Jesus. They are called to embrace the legacy of Moses and Elijah, challenging idolatrous nations and their leaders to return to the allegiance of the one true God. Suddenly, a dreadful beast emerges, overpowering and slaying the witnesses. However, God miraculously resurrects them, vindicating the witnesses in the eyes of their persecutors. This divine intervention leads to a significant outcome, Numerous individuals from among the nations ultimately repent and glorify the Creator God in the day of the Lord. Let's think about the story so far. The warnings issued through the seals and trumpets failed to elicit repentance from the nations, mirroring how the plagues of the Exodus only served to harden Pharaoh's heart. Yet, the Lamb triumphed over his adversaries not through force, but through the ultimate act of love his sacrificial death. The unveiled scroll of the Lamb now discloses the true mission of his followers, the Church, to manifest God's kingdom on earth by emulating the Lamb's sacrificial love. By choosing to lay down their lives rather than take the lives of their enemies, the Church embodies God's mercy. This counterintuitive strategy is what will lead the nations to repentance. This profound revelation, central to the Lamb's open scroll, is strategically positioned at the heart of the entire book, underscoring its pivotal importance. After this, the last trumpet sounds, and the nations are shaken as God's kingdom comes here on earth as it is in heaven. So now we know how the church will bear witness to nations and inherit the new creation, but who was that terrible beast that waged war on God's people? And how will the whole story turn out? John will tell us in the second half of the book of the Revelation. Before we move on to the second part of our journey through the sacred scriptures, I'd like to ask you to please subscribe to our channel and give a like on this video. Your support means a lot to us. And now, we will delve into chapter 12 until the end of the narrative of Revelation that's filled with vivid imagery, cosmic battles, and profound symbolism. After the seven trumpets, John stops the drumbeat of sevens with a series of visions that he calls signs. These visions explore the message of the open scroll in greater depth. The first one reveals the cosmic spiritual battle. 
that lay behind the suffering of the seven churches under Roman persecution. It's a manifestation of that ancient conflict that began in Genesis chapter 3. The serpent, who represents the source of all evil, is depicted here as a dragon. It attacks a woman and her seed. They represent the Messiah and his people. Then the Messiah defeats the dragon through his death and resurrection, and it's cast to earth. There, the dragon inspires hatred and persecution of the Messiah's people. They will conquer the dragon by resisting his influence, even if it kills them. John's trying to show the churches that neither Rome nor any other nation or human is the real enemy. There are dark spiritual powers at work and Jesus' followers will announce Jesus' victory by remaining faithful and loving their enemies, just like the slain lamb. John's next vision retells the story of the same conflict, but this time in the earthly symbolism of Daniel's animal visions. John sees two beasts empowered by the dragon. One of them represents national military power that conquers through violence. The other beast symbolizes the economic propaganda machine that exalts this powerless divine. And these beasts demand full allegiance from the nations, and that's symbolized by taking the mark of the beast and his No 666 on the forehead or hand. Now, this is an infamous image, and you won't discover its meaning by reading news headlines. John's making a clear Hebrew Old Testament reference here. First of all, this mark is the anti-Shema, the writing on the forehead and hand, it's a clear reference to the Shema, an ancient Jewish prayer of allegiance to God that's found in the book of Deuteronomy. This prayer also was written on the forehead and hand as a symbol of devoting all your thoughts and actions to the one true God. But now the rebellious nations demand their own allegiance, and they forced everyone to decide who they will follow. The number of the beast, a subject of fascination for millennia, was no enigma to John. Fluent in both Hebrew and Greek, he was well aware that Hebrew letters doubled as numerical values. By spelling Nero Caesar in Greek and beast in Hebrew, each term equates to 666. However, John's mention of Nero doesn't imply Nero was the sole embodiment of this prophecy. Rather, Nero exemplifies a recurring theme outlined by Daniel, nations transforming into beasts when they elevate their power and economic prosperity to the status of a deity, demanding unwavering loyalty in return. In Daniel's era, Babylon epitomized this beast, succeeded by Persia, Greece, and in John's time, Rome. This pattern continues with any nation that behaves similarly in the future. Standing opposed to the beastly nations and the dragon is another king. It's the slain lamb. He's with his army, who have given their lives to follow him. And from the New Jerusalem, their song of victory goes out to the nations in what John calls the eternal gospel. And they call everyone to repent and to worship God and to come out of Babylon that will fall John beholds a vision of the ultimate judgment, illustrated through two distinct harvests. The first, a bountiful grain harvest, signifies King Jesus' return to gather his devoted followers. The second harvest, of wine grapes, symbolizes humanity's deep entanglement with sin, culminating in their crushing at the wine press. Throughout these visionary signs, John presents the seven churches with a critical choice, to defy the allure of Babylon and follow the Lamb, or to succumb to the beast and face inevitable defeat. With the path now clear, John introduces a concluding series of seven divine judgments depicted through the pouring of seven bowls, signaling a final reckoning. Despite the warnings, the narrative reveals that while some among the nations repent, others, echoing Pharaoh's defiance, curse God and resist repentance. This resistance sets the stage for the penultimate conflict at Armageddon, where forces, inspired by prophetic visions from Ezekiel, converge for a decisive battle against God's people, symbolizing either a literal confrontation or a metaphorical representation of divine justice. 
This culminates in the fourth and ultimate portrayal of the Day of the Lord, marking the definitive defeat of evil. John elaborates on three pivotal themes introduced earlier, Babylon's fall, the ultimate battle against evil, and the New Jerusalem's descent, each offering a unique perspective on God's kingdom's eventual realization. Firstly, the fall of Babylon is personified by a queen-like figure, embodying the Roman Empire's military and economic might, yet destined for downfall, reminiscent of ancient rebellions against God. This allegory extends beyond Rome, depicting a perpetual human condition of defiance against the divine, culminating in Babylon's replacement by Jesus' kingdom. But how will Jesus' kingdom come? The story circles back to the day of the Lord, previously portrayed through images of fire, earthquakes, and harvests, but now represented as the ultimate confrontation. Suddenly, Jesus emerges as the formidable hero, the embodiment of God's word, astride a white horse. He stands poised and determined, prepared to vanquish the evil that plagues the world. But pay attention. He's covered with blood before the battle even begins because it's his own, and his only weapon is the sword of his mouth. In this narrative, John emphasizes that Armageddon will not unfold as a carnage-strewn battlefield. Instead, Jesus will overcome evil, not by means of violence, but through the profound and transformative power of his sacrifice. Following this, John witnesses the resurrection of Jesus' martyred followers who have been murdered by Babylon, and they reign with the Messiah for 1,000 years. After this, the dragon, instigator of humanity's revolt against God, unites the world's nations in defiance against God's realm. Yet, in the presence of God's throne of justice, they confront the inevitability of their eternal downfall. Thus, Agents of spiritual malevolence and those who reject participation in God's kingdom meet their end. They receive their desired autonomy, existing in isolation, solely for themselves. Consequently, the dragon, Babylon, and all their adherents are permanently isolated, forever prevented from tainting God's renewed creation. Significant debate surrounds the interpretation of the 1,000 years in relation to the two battles. Some believe it represents a literal sequence. The return of Jesus, succeeded by a thousand-year reign on earth known as the Millennium, culminating in God's ultimate judgment. Others view the thousand years symbolically, representing the current triumph of Jesus and the martyrs over spiritual wickedness, with the two battles illustrating different perspectives on Jesus' eventual return. Regardless of the perspective adopted, the core message remains unequivocal. Upon his return as king, Jesus will definitively eradicate evil and vindicate those who have remained loyal to him. The book concludes with a final vision of the marriage of heaven and earth. An angel shows John a stunning bride that symbolizes the new creation that has come forever to join God and his covenant people. God announces that he's come to live with humanity forever and that he's making all things new. This vision is a vibrant mosaic of Old Testament prophecies, envisioning a renewed heaven and earth free from historical anguish and malevolence. It represents not just a return to the Edenic paradise, but a progressive leap into the New Jerusalem, a magnificent city where diverse human cultures coexist in peace and harmony under God's sovereign rule. And in the most surprising twist of all, there is no temple building in the new creation because the presence of God and the Lamb, which was previously confined to the temple, now suffuses every part of the new world. This ushers in a new humanity, answering the original call from the Bible's opening pages to govern as God's image bearers, collaborating with God to steer creation into unexplored realms. Thus concludes John's apocalyptic vision and the grand narrative arc of the Bible. John's apocalypse is much more than a cryptic prophecy. 
It stands as a source of hope and, and an encouragement for perseverance among early Christians and future generations alike. It exposes the recurrent pattern of human rebellion, epitomized by Babylon, alongside the lasting assurance of salvation and rejuvenation through Jesus Christ. The text holds out the promise that Jesus will one day eradicate all forms of evil from his creation and rejuvenate everything. This central theme fosters sustained loyalty and faithfulness in anticipation of the King's return, encapsulating the essence of the Book of Revelation. Thank you so much for joining us this far. If you'd like, we've selected two videos for you to continue exploring the beautiful words of the Scriptures. If you found this content helpful, I ask for your support with your subscription so that you don't miss any of our upcoming videos. Thank you for being here and may God bless you.